Thank you so much, uh, Maro um, And it is a, uh, a great pleasure to uh, be here. I feel uh, quite humbled that on a, at the end of a long day at 5 o'clock, so many people, uh, people come to, uh, to listen to this. I don't want you to, to just listen. Uh, please stop me, ask any questions during the, uh, the, the presentation. I, uh, I, I, I know it's late, and I hope you will have many, many questions. Uh, why am I uh, presenting this here? Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to, uh, to Wider for, for putting this uh, up. Um, we started this program. We're very keen to tell everybody about a program that's going to run. I have no research results, but we have a, a new research program, and we hope that, that the researchers here will uh, engage with that in one way or the other. We hope that, that UN organizations uh, like, like Wider and others that, that care about gender equality, uh, people from other international organizations that may not be doing uh, the research will, uh, will engage uh, with us. Uh, in my short career at IDRC, this is, this is a flagship uh, program. And, uh, and uh, I was watching Barcelona last night beat Ajax. And, and I thought, this, this, got, this has to be the Barcelona program. It has to all come together. <laughs> And work very well. So, so for all those those reasons, and not to keep you any longer, uh, this is why I'm I'm very happy to be here, and, and thank you all for uh, for coming. This is a new research program uh, supported by uh, DFID UK Aid. Um, it's managed by and financially supported by IDRC, my organisation, and the third organisation involved in this is the the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, and and this, this, this is a, uh, a phenomenally interesting uh, mix. IDRC, many of you will know IDRC. Uh, we support research uh, uh, in directly working with, with researchers in the, uh, in the global south to, to support research and to support research uh, capacity. Um, DFID has, has probably the, the world's largest uh, fund for development uh, research. And, uh, and, and in that emphasizes uh, the highest quality of research. I don't think that capacity building and high quality research are, are, are mutually exclusive, of course, but, but to work together with an organization that focuses on, on top quality research, particularly in a sensitive topic. Okay, at times a sensitive topic like, uh, like gender is, is, is for us an enormous bonus. And then the Europe Foundation has a slightly uh, different organization. It, it's been wonderful to develop a proposal with them. And they, they kept asking me all sorts of, we, we developed a, a program document for this, uh, for, for the, the approval of this program. And they kept asking all sorts of questions. And finally, I understood wh why they were asking this question. They said, no, no, my question is, why do you do research? Right, and for somebody who sits in a research organization. And the question was absolutely right. They said, like, the Hewlett Foundation is, inter like the development agent, that, like all the development agents, they're not interested in research per se, but they're interested in what research can do to, to improve, uh, improve well-being. Now, um, I, before I start, or rather before I forget, let me just, uh, uh, if you allow me, I just want to show you uh, a short video. This was actually done for a similar launch that we, uh, that we did in... Uh, uh, in, in, in Ottawa about a, um, uh, a month ago, where Ruth Levine tells, uh, uh, told the attendants here, the people there, and, and I'd like to show that here as well, why, uh, why the Hewlett Foundation was interested in this. And it worked. The economic empowerment of women in the developing world is and positively with so many of the development outcomes that we care about whether it's the health of the woman, her ability to control the timing and number of pregnancies, the health of her children, the welfare of her family, her community, and the society at large. All of those things are positively related to the economic empowerment of women. But there's so much that we don't know about what the drivers are of greater opportunities for women to be employed, to engage in entrepreneurship and to control economic assets. Without that knowledge, we cannot know which policies to promote and develop at the global, regional, and national levels. For that reason, we at the William and Flora Hewitt Foundation are delighted to be starting a new program of research 
with our colleagues at the International Development Research Center, with whom we've partnered many times before, and also with colleagues at the UK Department for International Development. Together, we are bringing together resources to support a new round of research on women's economic empowerment, to learn together and to make a contribution to global knowledge about what the determinants and consequences are of greater empowerment for women. All right, so uh, four things I want to uh, talk about. Um, a little bit about why we're doing this. Uh, not much left to say after uh, that wonderful introduction by, uh, by Ruth. Uh, a little bit about the research uh, themes and questions that we hope to, uh, to cover, how we're going to, uh, to do that. And, and a little bit of a discussion around uh, the point I raised earlier is this is not research. But, 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 but how is this going to uh, matter for policy making, for, uh, for, for action, and, and, and how, and this is not a question I have an answer to either, but, but how does one organize research in a way that it's more likely to have a, a, the, the kind of impact on policy that we're, that we're hoping for? Uh, uh, as my local said, I, I work for the International Development Research Center. Within that, I, I lead one of the, uh, the programs that some of you know, which is called Supporting in, uh, Inclusive Growth. Um, the emphasis we put in that program, and that's, that emphasis is, is very much at the core of the GROW program as, uh, as well. Uh, for us, inclusive growth is not simply a question of redistribution growth, but it's actually around uh, the, the the, uh, or we support the research that promotes the opportunities for uh, gainful employment and, uh, and livelihoods. And, and most of our work, hence, has focused on, on research of issues of, uh, of entrepreneurship across the global south uh, and uh, jobs. Uh, our people are interested in the program more, more broadly. Uh, that's there, of course, under the IDRC website as well. So why did we think that uh, um, Program on Women's Economic uh, Empowerment. Uh, I keep saying Women's Economic Empowerment. For the longest time, we had this wonderful, ugly acronym called WE, and we cheated. We wanted to find something, something more attractive, so that became, became GROW. Of course, we slightly cheated. So I will still refer to it as Women's Economic Empowerment. Um, there, so what was the rationale for this, uh, this, this program? Um, we think that the data shows us that there's been uh, enormous, well, enormous, there's been much, probably not enough, progress in uh, uh, many gender indicators, uh, but of course with, with enormous uh, variations. Um, more importantly, perhaps, we, we think uh, that we've seen more progress on and knowledge of, of course, the knowledge, the, the, the knowledge of presumes it's presumed that we have the knowledge before we can make the first statement, uh, but we definitely think that there's been more research on the progress in, uh, in, in education and, and health and less on uh, economic empowerment. If you take uh, data from uh, the World Economic uh, Forum that does a report on gender every three years, one is, is coming out uh, this fall actually, uh, you actually can with the indices they use, you can actually compare uh, the, the progress, quite easily compare the progress on the, uh, the different types of, uh, of, 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 uh, of aspect of, of equality. And that quite clearly shows, and I don't think it comes as a surprise to, uh, to, to many people, that, that education and health uh, has shown uh, a positive tendency towards reducing gender disparities. Uh, uh, enrollment rates has been very, very clear. That has been less the case of economic empowerment and also actually, uh, and perhaps even more, uh, on, on uh, political empowerment as well. I'd, I'd recommend uh, the World Economic Forum uh, report on, uh, on, on gender. So um, if uh, we go along by, by that idea uh, that, that more uh, knowledge, and it's, uh, comparatively speaking, is, is needed on, on economic empowerment, we came to the conclusion that, that we need to uh, know more about uh, the various disparities within that, uh, things like the type and conditions of work, uh, access to business assets and finance, uh, wages and other returns, and, and care work. Care work, 
uh, I said earlier, we focus on, on, uh, on entrepreneurship and, and jobs. Uh, in a workshop that we, uh, we had in, in, in London with Professor Naila Kabir, one of the conclusions came out very strongly that you, that you, you cannot, and, and it's a question to a research community that focuses on, say, a labor market and how women uh, uh, participate in labor markets. Uh, uh, one might well imagine that the, the typical uh, day of a poor woman in, in many parts of the, uh, of, of, of the world consists of, of dividing her time between something like entrepreneurship, something like labor markets, and definitely, of course, uh, care, un typically unpaid care, uh, care, care work. So uh, that brought us to the conclusion that the research program really needs to focus on the interaction between the two. Uh, and, and one of the questions that we will have to people doing uh, a typical labor market analysis is how much that analysis will actually tell you about, say, the rationale, uh, or particularly of women that, that, that are forced to spend so much time on, on other activities. Um, anyway, um, in, in, in general, um, uh, of course, there. We, we, we're not arguing that there's no research on those issues. The take wage disparities, I, I can make, I, I don't bet, but if I bet it's like, you know, typically wherever you go, whether it's the Harvard Business School or poor women in, in the village in India, women will not earn more than 75% of what men earn. I mean, there's, there's some, you know, generic facts that, 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 that are not going to, you know, not, not much new is going to come up. But, but, but the causes of those, those inequalities, the, the, the different types of inequalities that, that exist in, in different regions, and particularly how these manifest themselves in, in the poorest countries, uh, we, we concluded was of, uh, of, of crucial importance. Um, one, one more reason why we, uh, why we thought that, that this, this is a very good time uh, for us with, with the development community to uh, to take up this research program. What we do see is, uh, and this will also be part of our, our strategy of, of, of outreach uh, with the research program, that, that, that in the private sector, there's globally, there's an enormous interest in uh, gender equality. And, and, and we, we hope, we believe, that there's a dynamic there that we can, we can build on, can, uh, can work with. And, and that, that I think is, is nicely, you read that in many reports, the, the chief economist of the, one of the large banks in Canada, TD Bank, is, is very concerned that women don't make it to the highest position uh, in, in, in their boards. Uh, the, uh, the reason for that is that she or he may be a feminist, but also that the TD Bank, the argument there is that, that, that if, there, if there is a discrimination uh, against, say, half your population in that segment of the, of the labor market, obviously you may be lo losing out on, uh, on, on innovation. What this graph shows, this is straight from the World Economic Forum uh, report, uh, is, is uh, that uh, this is not a correlation, this, this suggests a correlation, uh, this is not a causation, of course, uh, but that there's no trade-off between gender equality and competitiveness that overall countries that have uh, better indicators in terms of gender equality also are more competitive. I'm not saying this is true. This is for you to go and research and critique and all. These are just some data. And the point I was making here is, is that, that, that for a business community or for the a community that, as the World Economic Forum articulates that, there, there is this feeling we need to do more for not only uh, because we care about uh, equality for women, but also for a broader public good, uh, we need to do more on, uh, on, on issues of gender equality. Um, we have some definitions of economic uh, empowerment. Uh, uh, these are not terribly important because this will be a research program. We will be asking people to propose research, and, and, and each research team will have a slightly different definition. But, but we drew on, on, on two, of course, different, uh, uh, as, as they were part of the, uh, one of the three main organizations, uh, the funding this initiative, uh, and, and one from the, OE, from the OECD. Uh, which, and the importance there, of course, is it, it's, uh, when we talk about, again, inclusive growth, that it's not only about, you know, thinking about the benefits of growth, but, but really the participation in, uh, in, in growth process. In the research program, uh, we're, we'll be looking at uh, three uh, teams. Uh, there's slightly different modalities. I'll come back to that uh, a little later. But, but there are three areas that we thought were, were critically important. And I'll go through this 
uh, uh, next. Um, the first one is uh, a simple question, but, but very important. Very important also because uh, they are very different in different, they may be very different in different contexts, despite the fact that, that, that across the globe women probably earn 75% of what, uh, what men, uh, when men earn. But in each context, these are, uh, these are different. Um, we are going to uh, look, uh, ask people to articulate research questions around the forms of employment and entrepreneurship that are empowering. Uh, the constraint and choices uh, on the different types of uh, employment, self-employment, wage employment, entrepreneurship. Uh, very importantly, uh, the silos of, of care work, both paid and unpaid. Paid care work is actually an incredibly important area as well. For example, people uh, were telling me that uh, the large, take the large uh, new social protection programs in India, that has created a, a huge uh, almost like a labor market in, it, uh, in, in, in itself of very poorly paid work. And typically, the, the typical st gender stereotypes are reinforced in those, uh, in, in, in those jobs. So, so unpaid care work, of course, is an important area, but also the paid care work is a very important area of, uh, of, of research. And, and also an area where productivity gains compared to the rest of the economy typically have been, uh, have been lower, where innovation has been limited. So, uh, more broadly, the constraints to women's position in the household, uh, as well as the wider society and the economy, and how that determines women's individual choices and, uh, and, and, and agency. And, and, of course, with that, though not all the research projects need to, to exactly address that, but behind that, of course, is the question on how these barriers can be, uh, can be addressed, uh, around issues around women's time, fairness at work, access to finance, and, uh, and so on. Please don't tell anybody I showed you this data, but this is, this is well, these are not my data. This is, this is actually what you get if you take the ILO data on labor force participation. Uh, and basically, that tells you uh, one of three things. One, this data is completely crap. Um, well, that's actually the most, the most likely one. If we believed any of the data, what we then see is that there's a, a, an enormous variation of labor force participation particularly in low-income countries. Again, I come back to the first point. That may well be completely crap, of course, and particularly in poor income, in low-income countries, this may well be under it. But the third thing, then, if we look at women's labor force participation, and this is just what the ILO data tells you, that variation is even larger. Now, whether this is bad data, whether this is under-reporting, whether it's reality, for me, it doesn't matter. This is the global knowledge we have on it. This is what the international agencies put out in terms of what women do. So you can't tell people I showed you, but I blame somebody else uh, for it. Um, we, we've started to look at, and this is just some, some uh, this really to illustrate on uh, the, uh, the kind of things we're looking for if, uh, if we, uh, in this research program. Just to highlight this research program, we'll focus on, on low, income, uh, low income countries. Uh, and we define that in the call for proposals, it, it's quite precisely defined uh, as low-income countries defined by the World Bank, but, but I'm sure that I don't, you know, we'll be cheating on that. We, we won't stick exactly to those definitions. Most importantly, probably, because it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to do research on, on growth and, uh, and, and, and gender equality if you don't take into account uh, the countries that actually have, uh, have grown. So, so the focus is that of the program is the knowledge that is relevant for low-income countries. Uh, and, and, uh, 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 but but we, we define that a little bit more. We will implement that a little bit more broadly. Now, we, we started to, uh, uh, or a student at Laval University actually, have started to pull together some, some data that we, that we have uh, around some of the key indicators on, on women's economic empowerment. And I, and I just hope that this is slightly better than what the ILO, uh, ILO produces. Uh, and, and then you see, uh, we, we, we divide it in, in, within this category of maybe 40, 50 low-income countries, uh, five regional zones. And then you, you, you get very interesting uh, differences. Uh, this is labor force participation rate for, for men and women. And then you see, particularly in South Asia, how low that labor force participation is. Actually, um, 
these are unweighted figures. If, you, if we're going to weight them, this is even more extreme because particularly India, and even there's large disparities between, between India and Bangladesh, for example, where labor force participation rate, the recorded labor force participation rate in Bangladesh is much higher than uh, Africa. The, the differences there, I don't know whether these are seen as, as large or small, uh, but, but uh, this is the first idea that we have that even you know, within that group of low-income countries, there's quite large variations too. There's now, I, I, I don't actually know the data very well, others may know this better, uh, the World Bank, or through the World Bank, it's published on the World Development Indicators now, uh, information about uh, access to fi uh, financial, formal financial institutions, uh, and then uh, we see well, probably a predictable pattern of, of, of uh, that lowest in Central Africa. And, and across that, always, you know, seems to be so common, like, like women's access, about three quarters of that of, uh, of men. And it's, it's quite general, uh, the difference is quite general across uh, regions. Again, South Asia probably stands out, or the disparities are a little larger. Uh, whether there's good data on, on wages, disparities on a global scale, we, we don't know. Uh, we just found a number of... Uh, a uh, number of country uh, cases reported in ILO reports. I, I think there's actually actually more, and 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 then you know the the, the differences here are, are quite striking if these are, are true, and and of course there will be something that uh, that uh, Stephen Dirk and at the FD of course emphasizes is, of course there's a large heterogeneity in terms of gender biases, and and there will be cases where women earn more than. So that was the first question, with just some, some idea of the, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of the, uh, the, basically the areas that we're, uh, that we're looking at. The second set of questions is around the impact of patterns of growth on women's economic empowerment. Um, and we think that, and perhaps not, not a huge surprise, thank you. Uh, that, uh, that is a huge variation. Not all economic growth uh, promotes gender uh, equality. Some of the fastest growing countries show least signs of, uh, of progress on gender equality. I think China is, is, is an example. Uh, 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 Chinese leaders probably will now look back at it and, and, and probably realize that that's very important mistakes if, if it is true that China had large degree of gender equality at the start of the reforms, that, that, they, that they made some, some very serious mistakes in, in terms of the, 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 the policies that were, that were needed to support women to, to, to go along with that economic transformation. Uh, but in any case, you know, we see a huge change in the role of, of, of women alongside uh, China's uh, very rapid growth and economic transformation. Uh, we will be interested in research that looks at, uh, at exactly what, what determined in, in those patterns of growth, what determined uh, women's, uh, women's roles and responsibilities and empowerment, uh, including issues of competition, uh, liberalization, technological change. Technological change, I think, is incredibly important. Uh, we, a couple of days back, we had a discussion and people were talking about uh, um, uh, where jobs were created and things like male and female uh, jobs, which, 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 which I think is, is, yes, there are things associated with men and, and women, but, but these are issues to be researched. I've seen you know, across the world the same types of job in one part of the world being a typical male job and other parts of the world being a typical female job, and these change over, uh, over time, and, and, and certainly in technological change often uh, played a very important role in uh, that. Uh, so, and then, then with that, of course, uh, a key question is, 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 this is not about, you know, whether growth is, is good or bad or not, but really from uh, that analysis, what can we conclude in terms of the kind of policies that, 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 that need to be put in place to make, say, say those, those patterns of, uh, of growth more pro-poor, more, uh, more pro-gender equality uh, in, in the areas of, of education, childcare, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are the same data, but then grouped by countries, and uh, to to uh, where again you see 
this is what do we do? The formal financial institution. It will come as no surprise that there's a group of countries where where gender equality is, uh, or for, to most people, won't, won't come as a surprise. Gender equality is uh, is, is 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 very very high. Uh, that uh, you know the some good news perhaps the uh, the trend is upwards. Uh, countries that are richer on on average have more uh, equality in terms of gender. There's, there's some. Uh, uh, probably arithmetic uh, uh, necessity in that anyway, but 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 as important as the upward trend, I would say the enormous uh, disparities you get between countries uh, in terms of gender disparity uh, between countries in at the same level of uh, of GDP. Uh, labor force participation again, uh, you know, I hope that. We're going to make sure that, that people will come up with a sensible story about that. Uh, we see, and that may be true, that uh, the, the uh, women's labor for, female labor force participation uh, goes down as, or, or is lower uh, as compared to men in, in countries that are, uh, that, that are richer. This may be just a structural transition uh, in the sense of, and, and your work might tell us a little bit about that, if you, because of the way that work is recorded in agriculture areas and in urban areas, that may, some of that may be just the, uh, uh, um, uh, an effect of that. But then again, whatever exactly that line may, may be, again, the disparities at, at low levels of income both the heterogeneity, I would say, over uh, as, as countries go richer, and, and the enormous disparities at the same levels of GDP is, uh, is something I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just missing a point here, but we need to know much more about it. We need the mic, actually. No, it's fine. You are right that you have major measurement errors in the low-income countries because uh, they don't, uh, the questions aren't asked right. And so there are different um, definitions of work and people have different ideas about work. Uh, uh, and so um, uh, that's a big problem with that data. But in addition, we see that um, richer countries, uh, the f uh, labor force participation rate falls because people stay longer in school, especially girls wow. in richer countries would stay longer in school. I think it still holds if you, it's still a mess. So, and one thing that, that, that you know, just imagine that we were sitting here and, and, and talked about, in the international development community, you talked about health and education, and you got a messy picture like that. Nobody would find that acceptable. Apparently on labor, you know, I don't know what the ILO has been doing for 30, sorry, it's coming from the ILO. And, I know why the World Bank has been measuring this. I don't know why, you know, why the international community as, as, as a whole hasn't, uh, uh, hasn't paid more attention to it. So one of the outcomes may well be uh, suggestions for improvement of data, the outcome of a research program like that. Sure, yeah. But there's none in here, right? Doesn't suggest anyone. Yeah, I, I think it's, it, you still get a similar picture, actually. But, uh, but, but anyway, the point is right. We, we, need, to, uh, we need to do that. I, I, I'll, I can't recall which one this was, but yeah, we'll definitely. But I think we all agree. It's still, <laughs> whatever you do, it's still a mess. Anyway, so the, um, the, the third set of, so it was the first two set of questions, uh, barriers uh, for women and, and, and patterns of growth. Uh, and, and, and gender equality. The third one is, is the other way around, um, and that's the question, does women's economic empowerment promote uh, growth? Uh, and, and in general, uh, there's a lot of evidence out now that, that makes the instrumental argument, basically, for, for gender equality, that more equal, e economic participation for women uh, also improves uh, efficiency, productivity, and competitiveness. And, and, and it's intuitive in a way, right? Because if you restrict half your population from contributing to, to, to all these improvements, then of course it's, 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 it's less likely to, uh, uh, to, to lead to a uh, um, better outcome. Uh, 
but then, of course, the, those links are, are not as simple as, uh, as that, and we definitely feel that, that this needs further, uh, uh, further investigate that, that relationship, that we really want to come with, with, with more credible evidence than we have now on that, uh, on that relationship. Uh, and, and then, of course, that also is, is not a, a, a yes or no type of question, but there will be certain forms of over-empowerment that are more likely to contribute to growth than, uh, than others. There may be other forms of, of, of uh, over-empowerment that, that, that does not have that potential. That is not a reason not to, not to promote that, but it's important to distinguish those, uh, those arguments. All right, so these were the, the, the three questions we have. Um, very quickly before uh, you forget what the three were, uh, the first two questions uh, that we now have the call for proposals uh, out that's on our website. Some of you will know it, I'll show it uh, at, at the end. Um, what we're aiming to do there on questions one and two uh, is, uh, is to commission to award uh, about 15, 20, depending on, uh, on, on how large the, propo the, the proposed research uh, funding uh, is sorry we have a fixed set of uh, amount of money but it depends on how large the proposals are uh, so on, we we expect that we will uh, commission about 15 uh, mid-sized research projects uh, and as i said before very much with a focus on low-income countries or at least the the um, uh, to make sure that the knowledge that is produced is relevant for low-income countries which may well be analysis of middle-income countries there was a question there i think but you need to use the mic Just on that point, is it prescriptive or not? Because you mentioned China a few times, obviously not a low-income country, but right. you seem to think that it has a, an important story to tell. Yes, I know it does. The, um, but, but, but there's also politics around it. So, and so the very precise formulation there is, is that we, and it's partly be a balance of, of, of the research projects, all 15 cannot be on China. Uh, that, that, that's obvious, but, but also that each of the proposals there will have very clear lessons for low-income countries, right? And, and, and it's logical in a way, because how can you analyze growth if you don't look at countries that actually have grown? So yes, but please don't all come up with proposals on middle-income countries, because then we have a problem. See, one of the things that's really important in this, in the, in this program is, is, the, um, is the difficulty of doing research in low-income countries. Uh, there, um, and if I look at the, uh, the AERC and the, and the wider analysis of poverty, these are typically of countries that are coming quite close to middle-income country status and are middle-income country status, and, that, and that's good news. And I'm the, I'll be the last to say we don't need to do research on anymore. But what about the other 20 African countries that, that typically don't have the data where it's harder to do the research and where there's fewer scholars that, that, that locally that can undertake the research. So, so we, we are seriously going to stick to, you know, with the proviso, yes, we want to know more about China and I forget now, Ghana is a middle-income country now. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we'll let Ghana in as well. I'm sure it's very, very, very important. But we will, we will continue to focus on, we, we really want to make an investment in research in, in, in the other 20 countries, if you, uh, if you like, and just see how far we get. The quality won't be the same. More money will be needed. Uh, uh, all that is true, but, but that's really something that, that, uh, uh, that we want to focus on. So that's the, for the first two questions. The third one um, is, is slightly different. It's that there's a lot of... Uh, research out there and certainly at this stage uh, what we will do is, is commission a set of papers that call is coming out as well uh, in about two three weeks uh, commission a set of papers that that will uh, systematically synthesize the evidence of, of the existing uh, existing research at this stage at least we felt we shouldn't really commission uh, any any new research on that uh, aspect of it what kind of research? Um, as I said at the start, um, uh, the, the, the different donors, uh, the different funders of this program kind of, kind of uh, already highlight what we're interested in. Uh, the DFID uh, research strategy is very much on top quality uh, uh, research. 
uh, that's going to that needs to be published in, in peer-reviewed uh, journals. Uh, uh, people like Stefan Dirk, as the chief economist, Chris Whitty is the, the chief scientific advisor, really emphasize this point. And, and we know that not all that research will be of, the, of perhaps of the, the highest standards, but, but we find it, I absolutely agree with, with someone like Chris Whitty who says, but that's just not good enough. We need to work harder that in an area like this, that, that the quality of research need to be as high as, uh, as, as possible. So, so, though I have many arguments with, with, with the kind of research that is often commissioned and, and the, uh, uh, the, the focus, I think to put that pressure on that, to focus on quality research is absolutely right. Uh, at the same time, uh, and these are not trade-offs, this is, this is about balancing uh, the, the, uh, the, the funding and the, and the programming of, uh, of research. At the same time, we, as IDSC does, we find the strengthening of local research capacity very, very important. Uh, we will uh, explore various ways in which, in the process of research, we can make sure that that, that, that strengthened capacity primarily is going to take place in, in, the, in the places where it matters, uh, matters most. And the third one is the, is the policy uh, outreach or, or, or research, uh, research, research uptake. And as I said, the Ulut Foundation asked that question. Why? The question is really, why do you do research? Because it matters for, uh, for, for, for other things. And we're going to pay a lot of attention at the program level, as well as, as, as in discussion with researchers, IDSC does. Too. We're really going to quiz people on, so how do you think that this research is going to make a, make a difference. Every, we know everybody, and it's not because we don't believe that people are interested to do this, 99% of the people we work with, but, but there's techniques of doing this. There's certain ways of, 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 of articulating the research, engaging with policymakers that are more likely to, to have an impact on policy than, uh, than, than others, and, and we want to strengthen that component as well. Uh, so the research approach, uh, multidisciplinarity, cross-country comparisons, that's all great. We, we, we think cross-country comparisons, I, I find them interesting. But the international organizations have a, have a, a comparative uh, advantage there. We, you know, we can fund cross-country research that, that people in country can't do. So, so we think it's, it's right for us to focus on that. But single country studies will be, uh, uh, will be equally eligible. Uh, and that's what I said. It's like we... We ask for a lot. That's why I said we need, we need Barcelona. We need Barcelona to address all those, uh, th those issues. Um. Yes, please. One second. In this context, though, what does it mean, multidisciplinary? Because I have a different background, and I'm attending here as an observer. And we have, uh, uh, I have a feeling that we don't have so much multidisciplinarity in terms of my understanding. So for you, what does it mean, mean multidisciplinary? What, what is your discipline? Huh? Your discipline? My discipline is uh, a different discipline, heritage, culture, okay. all okay. this kind of a discipline. Okay. okay? Well, I'm, I'm on your side. I was trained as a social historian. Uh, <laughs> and this is a research program that we hope will attract mostly you know, some of the very good economists that can do the quantitative uh, analysis that is needed for that. When I say multidisciplinarity, uh, the driver behind this, for me, would be different disciplines have different parts of the story to tell, so we need to bring them together. How people do that, that, that is, is really up to, uh, to you know, I, I think uh, single discipline, quantitative analysis of one country, absolutely fine, if that answers part of the questions we're interested in, and then we will look at the balance. Uh, teams of people that said, oh, I'm going to combine anthropological evidence with, with, with household survey analysis, that's fine too. The question about methodology for me is not exactly what method you use, but what the best way is to, to, to answer the questions that you ask. So did you have a question? No. Um, so I'm almost there. Um, and I, th yeah, I actually think that I, I started, well, I certainly started talking about it. But, 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 but just to emphasize that, uh, and, and this is not, not, this is something that IDRC has experience in. Many of you have experience in, but, but we don't have, you know, we have quite good answers on, on how do you uh, analyze uh, cross-country uh, data. I mean, I'm not saying they're right, but they're fairly precise. We don't have very precise answers to the question, how do you make sure that that research is, uh, does become helpful for, for policy and other forms of, uh, of actions. Um, 
one thing that we hope this program will do, uh, there, there is, of course, an advocacy agenda behind this. We, we think that promoting gender equality in this particular area is, is, is important. We think that, that a research program that is more than just the set of research projects, where you have an interaction of, of national and global levels, may help that advocacy. Uh, at the global level, of course, the national experience are important, but also that, 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 that researchers that work at national levels will benefit from a, an overall program that addresses similar, uh, similar questions. As I said before, it, it's, uh, the different donors and the different emphases of those donors is, 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 uh, is, is very important for us in that. Uh, and when and people who, who are familiar with IDRC uh, projects uh, have... Uh, I don't know what I'm going to say. I've, I've suffered from this. I've benefited from this. Uh, we, will, we, will, we, we ask lots of, we engage with researchers, asking them very specific questions about how they think research is going to be made uh, policy uh, relevant. What kind of findings uh, uh, does one think uh, may have what implications for what kind of policy and what kind of action? I, I added action to the policy. Very importantly for me, this is not just, just national policy, policy making, uh, but, but an engagement with the private sector. Obviously, because that's, that's where most of the activity and because of the energy that, that, that exists in addressing gender equality in the private sector is very, uh, very important. Uh, we're going to ask and, and, and help people develop the, the targeted audiences, policy windows, at what time uh, do people articulate their research, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, what kind of uh, strategy and means of communications uh, do uh, researchers uh, develop. And, and again, I think the, uh, a program like this, where we're going to bring, once the grants are in place, we're going to bring the researchers together, will be extremely helpful because there'll be an enormous amount of, uh, of peer learning in that respect. So, unless I've put you off completely, um, right now, so the, for theme one and two, that call is uh, up. Many of you will already have, uh, have, have seen it. These are the, uh, the web links. Uh, it's still up for about uh, a month, and, and we hope that, uh, that people will have a look at that. So, thank you so much again for, uh, for your attention. Uh, we're not finishing yet. Go ahead. Um, you, you expect to finish the project in five years, but, yeah. I, but I had a question about the length of the... Three years. Three, three years. So, um, and the openness of the sponsors to... Well, uh, well, we said multidisciplinarity, and we take that very, very serious. Uh, randomized control trials, if they... If they answer the type of question <laughs> well. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not, okay I know I don't know either I was just trying to formulate that what what I do think about now is that what Angus did Yeah, well, Angus Deaton says it, this, is, this is a very handy instrument. The problem is that it only answers 10% of the kind of issues that we're interested yeah, yeah. in, right? So, so if it is for that 10%, for that, that so that's, sir, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the second is they are very expensive, and our, our, our funding is limited, of course. And the third thing to say, and we will be uh, not quite coordinated, but working with the Gender Lab at, at the World Bank, to, to see kind of uh, in, in both ways they, they're looking to us sorry, the, the research connections we the connections with researchers and networks that we have and and if there's a case where oh this is a great proposal but but it doesn't get funded we can see if uh, so the answer is um, Yeah, go ahead. I think the floor is already <laughs> open for uh, questions. I don't so want to hug the floor, but I don't see anyone else. So like. Um, for example, um, I'm not thinking of it. I don't really have anything in mind, but I, yep. I, just, I could imagine. So somebody has an idea about a program that help women get matched. Yep. So that's a very specific thing. So some, yep. something like that could be. A <laughs> couple of points. Um, um, 
when you when you go from asia to africa especially looking at the women's uh, participation in the labor market as you have shown in the graph you see a big difference in south asia say for example its labor force participation is low and we go to africa it is very high in a country like tanzania say for example yep. uh, almost everybody is in the labor force gap is only about 5% so it doesn't uh, give a clear picture as to the gap itself if you look at the um, the labor efficiency units then you see the difference meaning uh, the uh, people who are coming to the labor force with the skills then you see the gap and it might be much higher than even south asia um uh, the second uh, point i want to make is mm, in south asia say for example labor force participation is very low even in a country like sri lanka it is much lower than the average 35% in the recent data released by un right there are few reasons among others one is say, for example 1 million women is working outside sri lanka right. when they go back they don't want to be in the labor force that is one thing secondly even the educated women after a while they opt out of the labor force mm. because of the pressure on the education of children mm. it is mostly the mother who take the children to the school tuition classes everything so if both are employed both parents are employed the mother opt out of the labor force mm. that may be one reason another reason for mm. uh, lower <laughs> it's not the um it is not discriminatory uh, issues as, uh, as such but maybe because of other social and economic pressures coming out of this itself so, well i know i for that any discipline and i mean you know i would say yeah you need to you need anthropological research to figure out you know what kind of choices are made and you need the best statistical methods to identify what we see is discrimination in the sense you talk about and how that varies across uh, across countries so these are exactly the kind of questions that i think are important uh, we have one question in the back over there and uh, one on the side thank you for making reference to the world economic forum reports i work for the world economic forum um i have uh, a, a general question which is really um more out of of ignorance and not being a researcher and and i'll ask in two parts a share an observation and, and um one is that from a policy point of view with corporations in particular or government institutions um the impact of human resource policy particularly for women of child bearing age is that something that will come out through the research i think helpful to mm. environment mm. actually shapes the decision mm. the second one is uh with the observation is with respect to cultural considerations mm. maybe more true depending on the religious makeup of a country mm. something that i'm also something that i observed uh, in two instances in Tanzania it would be interesting to see whether there's evidence uh, on this um one is the impact of uh, starting women's banks as well as starting uh, islamic banks mm -hmm. uh in terms of moving people out of the informal sort of financial sector and into the formal financial um and you know is that something that you also mm. or you will encourage uh, just right. move down one level the second was um had a driver at the previous uh, employer as i used to work for the government and he asked for assistance uh, with his wife who was running a shop called cola distributed and i said no problem he was a uh, muslim and i said so i you know i know the banking system find somebody who can explain they have uh, you know options available and he said no 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 i have to speak to the person and then i will do it on her behalf and so mm -hmm. this aspect of taking into consideration the cultural consideration for him it was inconceivable that his wife who is actually the one running the shop <laughs> right would you would know would sit with the banker and mm. and over the detail so uh um, mm. i don't right so so as as it follows uh, directly from from the previous question uh, that 
when we talk about constraint and choices as, as important kind of questions, these questions are, are exactly around that, as like we, we, where we see you know, the disparities in a form of participation or, 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 or access. It's important to, to understand that, that, that better. That may be religious, uh, but, but, but you'll find pretty large differences in uh, different indicators between different types of Muslim countries. Right? And, and, and that doesn't interest, I don't think that that's relevant because I don't think it's our, 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 our aspiration or, or job to, to change that. But then there are practices in those countries that are more, or that, that facilitate that or, or, or not, right? Uh, uh, what do banks do, right? If, if, uh, if, if banks make sure that there are women that can help women, then, then that barrier is. So, so, you know, if we find stories where, where those, rather than, you know, of course it's not about whether a particular religion is worse or better for, 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 for gender discrimination, uh, but, but to find aspects within that that facilitate, uh, uh, facilitate women's economic uh, empowerment. Comparison across countries there can be, uh, can be, very, uh, can be very helpful. Uh, and sometimes surprising. Um, as for your first question, that's something I, I actually, I, I, before you go, I want to talk to you about because um, it doesn't, we don't see that much arising in, 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 in the kind of research community, but I think it's, it's absolutely important. It, it's absolutely important for, 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 for two reasons. One, we, 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 as I said, we want this program is to make a difference in policy. We want to engage with the, with the communities that really make a difference. And business is very important in that respect, right? It, it, that's where the jobs, uh, where the, where the jobs are, are, are created. So, so for, you know, for our research outreach, we, we want to engage with the people working in that area. And like I said, in, 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 I see it in North America. Uh, we're going to find out whether it is the case in Africa. There's a, there's a, there is an enormous interest in those uh, issues, questions like, uh, like supplier diversity, the number of, of very large corporations that promote gender equality. It, it is very interesting, and we, our research community hasn't touched that, and we're very keen to uh, broker that. But also the topic, I think, is, is very, very important because... Uh, those companies, okay, so, so maybe the quantitative importance of those companies is not very large because there's not that many working in that. That doesn't make it less interesting, but, but quite restricted. But, but these examples may well be very important because if it is found that, that, that major companies uh, are, 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 are changing those patterns for the benefit of women as well as for, you know, for in the end for the profit of the company. These may well be, you know, f far more important examples as, as, as kind of models that, than any technical research we can do. So if we, if this program can help to articulate that, I, uh, like I said, it's not usually what we do, but if we can do that, I would certainly, it would come a little bit closer to becoming the Barcelona of the research programs. Hi. Yeah, I had a very quick and naive question. You say mid-size proposals. Is there any definition of what you mean by mid-size? Uh, and also um, a comment, I guess. Um, a lot of the, the kind of examples you've been giving seem to me to point towards quite descriptive uh, research approaches, potentially you know, mm. collecting some data on a small scale, but you know, cross-country descriptive or comparative case studies. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is also a focus clearly in this research program for, for potential high-quality stuff that could be published in top economics journals. Uh, um, do you see a conflict between, between the two? <laughs> uh, and where do you think the balance lies? Okay, Thank you. I mean, okay. So the first one, <laughs> I answer that first because it's easy. Uh, uh, in, you'll see it in the, in the call for proposals. It's in the range of 300000 to a million Canadian dollar. The Canadian dollar is about the US dollar. Uh, it's about the same. Uh, the second one, we'll, we'll, find, we'll find out. No, we want to, if, if this sounded descriptive, then, then that's my mistake because we, we, that, that's not what we're intending. Uh, I mean, the randomized control stuff. Yes, probably too expensive. Probably others that are better, better at it. One of the, when, but when it comes to, but it's a slightly different issue, isn't it? In, in terms of the, the top, the top journals. Now, one of the, the very interesting uh, 
uh, articles that, that uh, I just, this is wonderful because, because I learned so much uh, from, from developing this, was, uh, was in feminist economics. And uh, uh, th somebody analyzed uh, citation uh, patterns there, and it shows that feminist economists defined by the people that publish in feminist economists, I don't <laughs> take any view on this, quote those top journals, but not vice versa. The people who publish in, publish in uh, Cambridge journals, whatever, uh, do not quote the feminist, uh, feminist research. And we think this is a, this is a, 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 a problem, and there's a, there's, there's a barrier there that, 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 that whatever we can do, we want to, uh, uh, we, we want to break, to break through, that we want to make sure that you know, if it is the case that that kind of uh, uh, that the, the the type of research that get published in those top journals are important for for, for, for making a difference, then, then we do you know we're going to put a lot of effort into to, to you know whatever we can do to support people publishing in those journals as well. But but of course that's uh, you know that's 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 a very high target. We we have a log frame and. and for the longest time, I was I was had it in my mind. I'm going to be really ambitious and say more from, you know, that there will be a clear result in terms of more cross citation between feminist economists and the economic. Really getting at. Um, what what would probably be publishable in in some of the top journals is is answers to very narrow questions which can be cleanly identified. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, but that, that's, fine. That's, that's fine. That's the point. Whereas yeah. some of the stuff you were talking about are, are very big and important questions, yeah. but you can't get the kind of identification that right. these top right. journals right. like. Right. That, that's right. all I was getting okay. at. Okay. Uh, no, apologies and, and, if I wasn't and if, clear. if there are people here that, that, that wonder whether they should apply the answers, absolutely yes, because we do want to, uh, we, we do want to support that at the same time. And then bring, the, very important in the program, forget the, the citation for a moment, uh, but, 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 but it's to bring people together, to get a better understanding. And I say multidisciplinarity is about bringing people together, uh, a better understanding of what those, those more advanced me methods imply, what they say, what they don't say. Uh, yes, thank you for that, yes. Question? I think I think I have a question. My question is more of a a matter of pra pra practicability. You, you 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 have put a lot of emphasis that you want research from low income com uh, countries, and that taking into account the uh, earlier question about data uh, limitation uh, for those who do research on gender. That's a a big a big a big ob, 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 obstacle. Right. So, uh, are you planning to give uh, those researchers who comes with the projects funding uh, uh, as for data collection, or the uh, the fund a uh, funding that you will provide will include the uh, data collection too? Right. So, so in, uh, the answer is uh, that, that this is that is very important. That we're going to you know look for a balance of kind of high quality analysis that that uses existing data. Typically, not not a lot of that not not in the poorest countries, or it would leave out a lot of countries with with research projects that are are, are going to step outside that and, and going to 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 look into more difficult situations where the data is not available. Um, our uh, budget, of course, is limited. Um, how much we can support primary data collection uh, has to be seen on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis uh, because primary data collection is, 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 is expensive. Uh, uh, but it, it, it's definitely in... And, and then you know, the, the other thing about data collection is that... that um, kind of, a large investment in a one-off exercise if it's not likely to be, be carried forward. We, will look, we would look at the sustainability of that as well. Is this likely you know, to be taken up by others and, and repeated over time so that, it really, you know, that the investment is really w worth it in terms of, of, of supporting the, the, the local capacity? So, uh, so, so the answer is, is, is yes within our, you know, the limited means, I guess. But if you, you know, 
Congo. I mean, if you, if you, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you have ideas, no, seriously, if you have ideas to do that, like, you know, when, when, even, even in the wider, I mean, I'm very happy that, that the Congo now appears in, in, in the wider research programs, but it's, it's been a long time coming, right? We definitely do need to, uh, uh, need to know more about it. Questions? Any other questions? Um, I guess if there are no questions, I should close the discussion, the session. Thank you so much. Thank you.